Today, I'm covering three chapters of No Man Knows My History. Welcome back to Candlewick Library, I'm Cheryl. Today I'm talking about three chapters in No Man Knows My History, chapter 15, 16, and 17. Three chapters is a lot to cover in one video, especially because there was a lot going on during this time. However, the reason I decided to lump these three chapters together is because there's not really much to prove here. With a lot of the other chapters, it talks about things that happened or things people said, and there's a lot of people saying those things didn't happen. Or even if you say that you can find it on church sources, they will argue that it isn't true. And so that's been one of my main purposes of this video series is to show where you can find the proof and show pictures and lead you to the places that you can find this information. In these three chapters, there isn't much that is argued about. These things are horrible things that happened and almost everybody on both sides is going to agree that this is the way they happened. So I don't feel like I have to spend as much time on every little detail of it and also on pointing to the proof of it because that isn't how I felt when I was reading them. I already knew it happened. I could see that the other side also said it happened. And so I'm trying to lead you through these books the same way I went through it the first time. If there is one overarching theme to these chapters, it is this is going to cement that persecution complex that I've talked about before into their minds and into the future. So at this point, Joseph Smith had been run out of, of Kirtland. Unfortunately, he wasn't humbled by what happened there and his part in it. In fact, it really just added to his self-importance and his persecution complex himself. In chapter 15, The Valley of God, we see this as he comes into Missouri and he is met not with people asking questions about the things that went wrong in Kirtland or treating him weirdly because of it. All the saints turn out to meet him and greet him with singing and cheering. She talks about how these oldest converts that are here in Missouri that have gone through so much look at him being banished and all these bad things that happened in Kirtland, including the bank failure, as an answer to their prayers. They said that it was simply God's device for bringing the prophet to Zion to stay. Lyman White was quoted as saying, it had been a net to cull the saints out from that region to the blessed and consecrated land. So I think a lot of them felt like this was the separating the wheats from the tares that you'll hear a lot of religious people talk about where it is separating the real righteous from the non-righteous. Joseph and his family moved in with George W. Harris, whose wife, Von Brody, describes as attractive. Her name was Lucinda. There is a lot of speculation that during the time that his family was living with them, that he had an affair with Lucinda. And that is speculation, but she would later become one of his plural wives. During this time, Emma, his legal wife, also had another son, and this baby grew and survived and everybody saw that as a good omen. When these saints in Missouri had fled the areas that they had been in, they ended up in Far West. And Far West had had a lot of growth. It had been remarkable. They had built the city in the idea that Joseph had of the square plan, and there were 1,500 saints there. Just before Joseph showed up, all of the saints had gathered to dig out the ground for the basement where they wanted to build the temple. Joseph was excited by what he was seeing. This was no outpost with cabins scattered all over. This was a real city that was starting to take shape. So Joseph started to speak of Kirtland as she says, an era with contempt as seven long years of servitude, persecution and affliction in the hands of our enemies. But there were saints that had stayed behind that weren't backing him when he first left that have changed their tune. They've decided they don't like the things that are happening in the temple now that he's gone and they've decided to come west as well. The longer time goes on, they're, they're starting to forget about all of the bad things that have happened and the reasons that they were mad at Joseph Smith. And they're just remembering his magnetic personality with a lot of charisma. He could really make people excited about what he's talking about and make them feel good. And now that he's gone, they're noticing the absence of that. Shortly after he arrived, he rode up the Grand River to Lyman White's Ferry to explore the land. She writes, on a high bluff overlooking the river, someone in the party discovered the ruins of what seemed to be an altar and excitedly led the prophet to it. After examining it, Joseph stood silent, his eyes sweeping over the prairie that rolled away beneath him. In every season, the prairie was a garden. The glory of the scene made Joseph heady as with new wine. This is the valley of God in which Adam blessed his children, he said. And upon this very altar, Adam himself offered up sacrifices to Jehovah. This place is Tower Hill, and its feet we will lay out a city which shall be called Adam on Diamond. Here Adam, the Ancient of Days, shall come to visit his people. 
He shall sit on a throne of fiery flame, as predicted by Daniel the prophet, with thousand thousands ministering unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand standing before him. The saints had long believed that independence in Jackson County was the original site of the Garden of Eden. But now Joseph told them that Adam on Diamond was the land where Adam dwelt after his expulsion from Eden, and that far west was probably the exact spot where Cain killed Abel. And that is from the history of the church. I have found it so interesting to study that particular idea. When we were on our trip to the Ark in Kentucky, I think I've told this story on one of my videos before. My mom and my daughters and I went to Kentucky and on the way back we stopped at some church sites. One of them was Far West. We went to Far West to where the temple site was and then we went to Adam on Diamond. We sat in the car and had a picnic because we were going to have it outside but it was, I think it was cold or there were a lot of bugs. I can't remember what the reason we ate in the car. But then we got out and we walked around and there were quite a few people there. There were missionaries that lived there and they, they were out and about. There were tour groups going through so you could see people sitting around getting these Sunday school lessons basically on uh, church history. I doubt they were completely accurate, but that was all happening there. And it is a very beautiful place. As anyone who's been to Missouri can say, that area of Missouri is very beautiful. When we went to Far West, I, my mom was walking around looking at things. My daughters were running around. At this point, they didn't know that I was questioning our faith. And I was praying earnestly as I walked around saying, God, I have had all of these thoughts. I've been introduced to all of this doctrine in the Bible that contradicts Mormon theology. I need you to tell me if this is true. Because at this point, I had already stopped believing in a few things, but I hadn't yet gone away completely. This week I've decided that in the future when I'm probably done with the series, I do want to make a couple of videos on here talking about my life as a Mormon and then about my transition out to really go into this in detail. But I was praying so much and I felt so empty. I felt so empty. When we went to Adam on Diamond, I was doing the exact same thing. And again, I felt so empty. But it was a very interesting experience to be there and see what they saw and wonder if I was looking at that or not. I'd always wanted to go to Adam on Diamond and I got there and it was so anti-climatic for me because of what I had been learning. The other thing is the fact that they teach that that's where Jesus is going to come back to. And I'm not sure if they are still openly teaching this or not, but I know that I have relatives and friends who have told me that their husbands, when they were bishops, were told that yes, Jesus will come first and there will be a giant secret sacrament meeting, a big meeting with all of the priesthood holders, all of the men that have been given positions of power. So bishops, stake presidents, people in the 70, the prophets, all of those will be there for this. And Jesus will meet with them first to basically judge their what they did with their stewardship. And then I think that there's enough more after that before the whole world knows he's here. And I remember hearing that and just being like, well, that doesn't really make sense because it says that nobody knows the time. But I guess if my family, if I have family members that all of a sudden are up and go into Missouri, I'm going to know that it's about to happen. But then in my Bible study since then, I have seen where it says that Jesus will come and everyone will know right away. And that's when I realized that is false. He's not going to come in secret to anyone. And it says that, that he won't. And so all of this was an interesting thing for me to read about uh, this week as, as it brought back a lot of those memories and feelings I had when I was there and as I was studying that in the Bible. They all believed it. They really believed that not only was Adam and Diamond going to become this great city, but it is where the Garden of Eden had been and where Jesus would come again. And they were so certain that that was going to happen any day that more and more people were starting to come there. They were also converting a lot of people in England and they were very anxious to get out here to Missouri where they believed they were supposed to be when Jesus came again because they really did believe it was right around the corner. At this point, the persecution, I don't think it had gone away, but it wasn't as intense as it had been. Joseph was starting to see and that that might be something that they were going to have to deal with again. And she says, for the first time, he began to judge his men with an eye to their physical courage and quickness with a gun. He made Lyman White, whose foolhardy valor he had hitherto mistrusted, president of the new stake in the tent of Zion at Adam on Diamond. And he listened with interest to Samson Avard, who claimed to know something about soldiering and who had a secret plan for the defense of the saints. So Avard suggested putting together this army that would have secret passwords and, and secret signs, a lot like the Masons, a lot like the LDS church has in their temple. And they would not only act as an army, 
but also as bodyguards. So by mid-June 1838, there was whispered talk in Far West about these secret societies that were being formed called the Brothers of Gideon after the first Captain General Jared Carter, who had a brother named Gideon, the Daughters of Zion, the Sons of Dan, and the Danites. So Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon were careful not to be completely associated with them and to leave Avard to his own devices. She says that there are a lot of stories of their oaths and passwords and secret signs, and they are very consistent. And this goes for the people that were apostates, but also the people that were considered great. She says Orson Hyde, W.W. W. Phelps, and Thomas B. Marsh were among the, the, the men that gave witness to these groups, especially the Danites and the ideas that they were spouting at their meetings. But they later returned to the church and Hyde was even restored to full favor as an apostle. So their statements are worth noting and they fully corroborate uh, all of the other people's statements. And you can go and you can find these statements in courthouses and newspapers and all over from that back then. And she does give a list of those. By all accounts, Avard was a cruel man. There was one account that came from Joseph Smith himself. And he described Avard's secret instructions to his captains in part this way. Know ye not, brethren, that it will soon be your privilege to take your respective companies and go out on a scout on the borders of the settlements and take to yourself spoils of the goods of the ungodly Gentiles? For it is written, the riches of the Gentiles shall be consecrated to my people, the house of Israel, and thus you will waste away the Gentiles by robbing and plundering them of their property. And in this way we will build up the kingdom of God and roll forth the little stone that Daniel saw cut out of the mountain without hands and roll forth until it filled the whole earth. For this is the very way that God destines to build up his kingdom in the last days. If any of us should be recognized, who can harm us? For we will stand by each other and defend one another in all things. I would swear a lie to clear any of you. And if this would not do, I would put them or him under the sand as Moses did the Egyptian. And in this way, we will consecrate much unto the Lord. And if one of this Danite society reveals any of these things, I will put him where the dogs cannot bite him. And that is in the history of the church, volume three. In Joseph's history, he wrote that Avard was excommunicated as soon as he discovered these things that he was saying, but that's not true. He wasn't ex excommunicated until March 17th, 1839 which was four months after he had turned traitor and left the church. So between June and November of 1838, he did rule the Danites with a free hand and was one of the most powerful men in the church. He was a very violent man. And I think sometimes when people talk about the violence that was committed by Mormons at the beginning of the church, we think of Brigham Young. And I'll go into that later in another video, but Brigham Young had a lot of violence that surrounded him. But the violence from church members, actually the violent talk and the violent actions actually started much earlier than Brigham Young's presidency. And in fact, this Avar guy, he was very violent. Porter Rockwell, who was a bodyguard to Joseph Smith and then later Brigham Young was very violent, but also Sidney Rigdon. He was a very violent man in his speech. He was starting to get very angry seeing what was happening around them. And he felt like the men weren't stable, that people were dissenting. And he didn't rest until Oliver Cowdery and John and David Whitmer were cut off from the church. Of the 11 witnesses to the Book of Mormon, only Joseph's father and brothers were left in the church at this point. Peter and Christian Whitmer were dead and six had either left voluntarily or been cut off from the church. Many of the apostles were away on missions and Brigham Young was around and he was the only one capable of challenging Rigdon, but he had not yet been given his full power. At this point, there were a lot of dissenters that were trying to get the church involved in lawsuits, which is so interesting to me because that's happening now too. They're, the church is always having lots of lawsuits going on at the same time. But at this point, a lot of people were starting to try to get those going. On June 17th, Rigdon gave a public speech where he said, "'You are the salt of the earth, "'but if the salt hath lost its savor, "'wherewith shall the earth be salted? "'It is henceforth good for nothing "'but to be cast out and trodden under foot of men. And for an hour, he just spoke to all of the people getting angrier and angrier. And then he said, if the county cannot be freed of these men in any other way, I will assist to trample them down or erect a gallows on the square of far west and hang them up as they did the gamblers at Vicksburg. And it would be an act at which the angels would smile. And Joseph rose to advise against lawlessness at this point, but then he added a significant warning. I don't want the brethren to act unlawfully, but we'll tell them one thing. Judas was a traitor and instead of hanging himself was hung by Peter. Rigdon's sermon was called the Salt Sermon. And this became something that a lot of people were really angry about. It through the years has been something that people said didn't happen, but there's complete evidence that it did. And I talked a few videos ago about how the Whitmers and Oliver Cowdery and Lyman Johnson, that they got a letter warning them 
that they needed to leave. And if they didn't, within three days after they received the communication, that they would use any means to get them out of there. And this is the time when they sent that. When the two Whitmers and Oliver Cowdery and Lyman Johnson went to get a lawyer. And when they returned from Liberty, they met their families on the road bearing the tell of Danite persecution that the men could not believe possible as coming from their former brethren. The Danites had surrounded their homes, ordered their wives to pack their blankets and leave the county immediately and threatened death to anyone who returned to Far West. According to John Whitmer, they were robbed of everything but their bedding and clothes. Right after this time, Joseph also announced a reforming of the United Order that they were trying to have in Kirtland. That's Sidney Rigdon's baby. He really wants that United Order. And so every man, was supposed to give all of their property to the church, and then the bishop would re reassign things to people based on their family size. Rigdon said that anybody who failed to consecrate their property would eventually lose it. But this united order was extremely unpopular. And John D. Lee said that the people felt that their money was as safe in their own position, possession as it was when held by church authority. So they really didn't have any trust that they were going to take good care of it. So when Joseph saw that this was going to fail, he tried to modify it. Instead of asking for an outright transfer of title, he ordered the saints to lease their property to the church without consideration or interest for 10 to 99 years. And then the whole church was to be divided into four huge corporations, farmers, mechanics, shopkeepers, and laborers, which would utilize the land, machinery, and skills of the church members for the common good. But the Mormons were expelled from Missouri before they could get this going. So back to the Danites, Lyman White was so eager to get this going. So on the 4th of July, several thousand Mormons gathered in Far West for a great celebration. She said Joseph had chosen the day for laying the cornerstone of the temple and he planned to make it an occasion of pomp and splendor. The parade he had organized seven years earlier to celebrate the laying of the temple cornerstone in independence had been thin, thin, ragged, and a little ludicrous. But of this parade, he made a spectacle that amazed and frightened the old settlers who had poured in to watch the ceremony. Every Mormon marched to the temple site, the infantry coming first, followed by the church leaders and civilians and an impressive display of cavalry bringing up the rear. Here was the might of Zion for all to see. And at this point, Rigdon gave another speech that seemed to be, that seemed to be encouraging violence. And the crowd broke into wild cheering and yelled, Hosanna, Hosanna to God and the Lamb. And Joseph allowed it to be published in the Liberty Press, who had copies distributed in pamphlet form. But that obviously isn't going to go over well and was a mistake. Going on into chapter 16, the Alcoran or the sword. August 6, 1838 was election day in Missouri. For the first time in five years, the Mormons wanted to vote. They're showing up in Gallatin with these people who already didn't like them. Some of them violent, some of them not. But you have the added measure of they've been hearing about how the, there's the Danites. They've been hearing about Rigdon's speeches to those people who are already scared and worried about the Mormons. That looks to them like something they need to be paying attention to. So when they go to vote, a fight breaks out. The The Missourians are blocking them from being able to vote. They're, it's not fair. It's not constitutional. The Mormons were about 30 in number and the Missourians were over 200, but the Mormons were standing next to an area, I guess, that had these long sticks. And so they picked them up and they were able to start hitting them with it. And while that doesn't seem like a really dangerous weapon, they were inflicting a lot of hurt. And so the Missourians fled and nine men were stretched on the ground and scores of others were crawling away bruised. This incident broke the peace that they had had for a while. Even though no one was killed in the fray, the runner who brought news of it to Far West said that two Mormons had been slain and that Adam Black, who was Justice of the Peace in Gallatin, was uniting the Gentiles in an army to expel the whole colony of Adam and Diamond from Davies County. So Avard at once called out his Danite troop and Rigdon spurred them on to deeds of valor. He said, now we as the people of God do declare and decree by the great Jehovah, the eternal and omnipotent God that sits upon his vast and everlasting throne beyond that ethereal blue, we will bathe our swords in the vital blood of the Missourians or die in the attempt. So Joseph accompanied this little army to Adam and Diamond, where he then learned that the the report that they had got of the riot was greatly exaggerated. But instead of calling it off, he decided to march with the men to Adam Black's home. They went into him and demanded that he make a treaty with them. He did after some argument. But when others learned about this, they felt like it was forced, that he might have been worried about his safety and felt like he had to sign it. And there was a judge named Austin King, and he had hated the Mormons ever since his brother-in-law had been killed in a Mormon Gentile riot in Jackson County. And so he immediately issued a warrant for Joseph's arrest. Joseph refused to give himself up unless he could be tried in his own county. Lilyburn Boggs, now the governor, heard of this, so he ordered out six companies of militia to enforce the warrant. But through the intervention of some lawyers and some old friends, Joseph won the concession to not be tried 
at Gallatin, but half a mile inside the Davies County border. So he stationed his army along the county border and went to the trial secure in the thought that he wouldn't have an impromptu hanging. The saints left behind suffered during this time because the millers would refuse to grind their grain. They had no flour in far west and they had hundreds of immigrants arriving and they all were realizing it was going to be winter soon and they were not going to have the stores of food that they needed. At this point, the Missourians start acting badly again and they are prowling about firing haystacks and granaries, stealing horses and cattle, and whipping more Mormon farmers. The two big Mormon settlements of DeWitt and Adamondiamon were in a state of siege. The women and children were herded behind hastily improvised stockades, living off of cornmeal and freshly killed cattle. Joseph was finally able to get back with his people and he called every able-bodied Mormon in Caldwell County to the far west public square. On October 14th, he broke his long public silence by saying, we are an injured people. From county to county, we have been driven by unscrupulous mobs eager to seize the land we have cleared and improve with such love and toil. We have appealed to magistrates, judges, the governor, and even to the president of the United States, but there has been no redress for us. The latest reply of Boggs to our petitions is to tell us to fight our own battles, and that, brethren, is exactly what we intend to do. And then he said, All who are with me will meet tomorrow to march to the defense of Adam on Diamon, with the words of the Savior ringing in our ears, Greater love hath no man than this, that he lay down his life for his brethren. Some of the brethren aren't here today. Some of those that Brother Sidney likes to call, oh, don't, men. In time of war, we have no need for such. A man must declare himself friend or enemy. I move a resolution that the property of all, oh, don't men, be taken over to maintain the war. At this, Rigdon got really excited and he jumped up and said, and I move that the blood of the backward be spilled in the streets of far west. But Joseph silenced him and said, no, I move a better resolution. We'll take them along with us to Davies County. And if it comes to a battle, we'll sit them on their horses with bayonets and pitchforks and make them ride in front. The men cheered and the tension relaxed a little bit from the excitement that Rigdon had caused. As Joseph neared the end of his speech, all the pent-up hatred that he had so long suppressed broke forth with an unexpected violence. If the people will let us alone, we will preach the gospel in peace. But if they come on us to molest us, we will establish our religion by the sword. We will trample down our enemies and make it one gore of blood from the Rocky Mountains to the Atlantic Ocean. I will be to this generation a second Muhammad, whose motto in treating for peace was the Alcoran or the sword. So shall it eventually be with us, Joseph Smith or the sword. The next day, 100 Mormons marched into Adamondiamon to reinforce the 250 men assembled there under Lyman White. After a conference with the prophet, White addressed the men. He stood by a fine brown horse with a famous bearskin flung over the saddle. A red handkerchief was bound about his head with the knot in front and his collar stood open. The sword has now been drawn, he shouted, and shall not be sheathed until we have won back everything the mobs have wrenched from us. Our cause is just, the Lord is on our side, and it makes no difference if our enemies number 50 or 50,000. John D. Lee said that he felt himself bulletproof. I thought that one Danite would chase a thousand Gentiles and two could put 10,000 to flight, he said. The Gentile spies who heard the speech rushed to spread the news, and they said that the wild ram of the mountains had 15,000 men under arms ready to descend upon mob and militia alike. The Gentiles in the area, those that wouldn't have been violent and those that would have been, were scared. They hear that they're building this army and they hear what was said in the speech and they feel like it's directed toward them and that they're going to come and attack them no matter what they do. So the people scattered and hid. The Mormons did go out first at this point. David Patton charged into Gallatin with a mounted company and he found it almost deserted. The men promptly looted Jacob Stalling's store and set fire to it along with several cabins and they brought their plunder back to Adamondiamon. While Patton was raiding Gallatin, White, with another company, attacked Millport, and Seaman Brunson attacked Grindstone Fork. They rounded up all of the horses, all of the cattle and hogs they could find, and drove them back to Adamondiamon, but they didn't burn the cabins. Back in Far West, Rigdon spread news of victories and applauded when the first wagons piled high with what he called consecrated property pulled into the square. A lot of the saints there were not happy about this, and they really disapproved of them stealing stuff and bringing it back. And so they started to steal away with their families in the middle of the night. Rigdon, when he realized this was happening, said, the last man has run away from far west that is going to. The next man who starts shall be pursued and brought back dead or alive. I move a resolution that if any man attempts to move out of this county or even packs his things for that purpose, then any man in this house who sees it shall, without saying anything to any other person, kill him and haul him aside into the brush. All the burial he shall have will be in a turkey buzzard's guts and nothing will be left of him but his bones. Yesterday, one man in far west slipped his wind and was dragged into a hazel bush for the buzzards to pick it. But the man who lisps it shall die. And this speech was reported in detail by W.W. W. Phelps. And then it was also corroborated by a few other people. Within a week, every isolated Mormon cabin was a pile of ashes. 
the Missourians came to fight back and they came back more ruthless. Joseph ordered everyone into either Far West or Adam on Diamond for protection. And Gentile spies spread the report that an immense Mormon army was gathering and would waste the whole upper portion of the state. Two of the Gentile guys that had been burning and pillaging sent an express to Governor Boggs on October 24th, reporting that the Mormons had massacred a whole militia company of 50 men, which obviously wasn't true. They said this because there had been a skirmish. The militia company in question was led by Methodist minister Captain Bogart, and he had been ordered to patrol the border of Caldwell County. And on the day of the supposed massacre, it had done nothing more exciting than to enter the county illegally and capture three Mormons. A scout told Joseph that these people that were captured were going to be shot at sunrise. So Joseph dispatched 60 men under Captain David Patton, to effect a rescue. Those 60 Mormon men came up over the ridge at dawn. Their bodies were silhouetted, and so they were easy for them to shoot. One Mormon was killed outright and then fled to give the alarm. Patton at once ordered a charge down the hill, and the men rushed down in a fast, fast trot, shouting, God and liberty. Patton led this charge with his white coat gleaming in the early light. The men rushed on into the oak grove with drawn swords and charged over the bank. All of Bogart's men fled but one, and Patton was struck in the abdomen. Captain Fearnaught, as they called him, was he dropped to the ground and he died later that night. The Battle of Crooked River, as it was called, was reported to Governor Boggs as a massacre, but Bogart had actually only lost one man and the Mormons had lost three. So at the same time, Boggs also gets a report of the Muhammad speech that Joseph Smith had given. And he received a report from General Atchison, who said, civil war is inevitable. They have set the laws of the country at defiance and are in open rebellion. During all of this, Joseph Smith is preparing for a siege that he is sure is to come. And so at this point, Boggs orders what has famously been become to be known as the extermination order. And growing up, I was always taught that that was just because they hated the Mormons, but they hadn't done anything wrong. And that Boggs was just this horrible, horrible human being that ordered this extermination order for no reason. Now it wasn't a good order and it was ordered on bad testimony. But as we can see, as we learn more about the story, I think that most people that would see all of the information that Boggs was given and realize why he did it, and that he should have found out more information before doing something like that because of what we see that comes next. But he did have a lot of information that was leading him to think that this was inevitable and this is what he was going to have to do. I am in no way saying he's a good guy. I don't know enough about that, but I think it is important that we know the truth of why he ordered it. So at this point, all of the areas have been evacuated except for Hans Mill. Jacob Hahn had been told by Joseph Smith to evacuate but he didn't listen. He didn't want to desert his mill. He was afraid that if he left it, it would be burned down. And of course, Joseph did tell him, better to have that burned down than for all of you to die. And he was right. A wounded man stumbled into Far West with news that froze the blood of every saint, she writes. The settlement at Hans Mill had been attacked by 200 militiamen. The Mormons had fled into the blacksmith shop, which they thought would make an admirable fort, but it had proved instead to be a slaughterhouse. This is one of the worst stories of this time these people were just shot off completely. When these Missourians had them gathered, it, there's a tell that's told by both sides that one of them put his gun up to the head of a nine-year-old child and one of the men said, don't shoot him, he's a child, it's just a boy. And the man with the gun said, well, knit make lice and shot the boy in the head. Of the 38 men and boys in the camp, 17 had been slain and 15 wounded. All of the survivors had to try to make their way out of here to try to get to safety afterward. Before the day was over, they were told that Major General Lucas, who was in command, would be willing to meet with the leaders of Far West. So Joseph sent Colonel Hinkle, Coral, Peck, W.W. Phelps, and John Cummins Joseph sent them with a message saying, I a compromise must be made on some terms, honorable or dishonorable. Lucas's terms were harsh. He demanded first the surrender of the Mormon leaders to be tried for treason. Second, the cons confiscation of all Mormon property to liquidate Mormon debts and to indemnify the old settlers whose property had been damaged. Third, the immediate mass migration of all Mormons from the state. And fourth, the surrender of their arms. The alternative to these terms was annihilation. When Joseph heard these terms, he gathered all of his men together. He ordered them to take all of the plunder that they've been taking, that the Danites have been bringing in, and put it into one house so that no man would be found with something that didn't belong to him in their house and maybe get hung for it. And then the Mormon leaders did give themselves up. They were supposed to be killed the next day, but Donovan that was in charge of doing that, he refused to do it. 
He said, by God, you have been sentenced by the court-martial to be shot this morning, but I will be damned if I will have any of the honor of it or any of the disgrace of it. I have ordered my brigade to take up the line of march and to leave the camp, for I consider it to be cold-blooded murder. He was a good man who realized that that wasn't the way it was supposed to be done. The, these leaders, even if they've done something wrong, they're supposed to have a trial first. And so he would not follow these orders. At this point, the others realize that they probably will get in trouble as well if they're the ones that do it. So they decide to take them to independence. Now I'm in chapter 17, Ordeal in Liberty Jail. At this point, we also get many reports of horrible things that the Missourians did to those at Far West. They came in and shot their hogs and cattle for sport. The people were left to eat whatever they could find. Leading elders whom Joseph had warned to flee were hunted down. Those who resisted capture were shot. They raped women and girls that were left behind. And then they told them, they brought them all together and told them they brought this among themselves, they need to get out. Joseph was exhibited for a day in independence like an animal. And there he learned he was to be sent back to Richmond to stand trial in a civil court for treason, murder, arson, burglary, robbery, larceny, and perjury. Generals Lucas and Clark had finally been made to see that ex executing a civilian illegally would have unpleasant consequences. In the Richmond jail, the prisoners were chained together on the floor of a bare cell. And this is where you get one of the stories of Mormon history that we all love. And it actually is a really good story. I think it was told by Parley Pratt. As they laid there in their chains, the men in the jailers were talking about all of these horrible things they were doing to the, the people in Far West and talking about the rape and the pillage and all of these horrible things. And the way it's told is that they were giving detailed accounts of this. And Joseph Smith stood up in his chains and said, silence ye fiends of the infernal pit. In the name of Jesus Christ, I rebuke you and command you to be still. I will not live another minute and hear such language. See such talk or you or I die this instant. So the guards calmed down and stopped talking. They, he obviously did frighten them. And I think it would have been a very powerful thing to see. And I'm glad he did that. I'm glad that he stood up. I can't imagine what it was like to sit and listen to somebody talk about things like that, that they've done to innocent people in a way that was bragging about it. I think that hopefully most of us would have that same reaction Joseph did, and I'm glad that he stood up against them and, and made them feel ashamed. After five days, the men were unshackled and taken into court. Joseph had a horrible realization as he sees that the judge is again Austin King. He also wasn't going to have very many good witnesses because all of the men that would have been his witnesses were had been arrested. Samson Avard was brought in and he actually showed himself to be a traitor and an opportunist to the Mormons because he told everything, the founding of the Danites, the expulsion of the dissenters, the looting of Gallatin and Millport. He of course made himself not look as bad in the telling and then he gave them a document that he said was the Danite constitution. And it had a list of the Danite officers. And of course the lawyers pounced on this as proof of treason. The only defense that they could get were, were six, three of them women. And these were stifled by the judge almost as soon as they began to talk. Joseph was told, King is determined to see you in prison. Four of the men were kept in Richmond jail and the other six, including Rigdon and Joseph Smith, were sent to Liberty Jail in Clay County. Joseph entered the cramped stone cell of Liberty Jail on November 30th, 1838. Four months passed before his trial. He began to realize that things weren't going so well outside when Brigham Young brought news to him that a lot of people believed him to be a fallen prophet and Isaac Russell had already set up a little reformed church. Brigham Young had to defend the prophet before the high council. He said, Brigham Young told him that the hardest of all of them to silence was Joseph's own brother, William, who said, if I had the disposing of my brother, I would have hung him years ago. So Joseph now wrote to his people a defense and an apology. He did not deny responsibility for the Danites, but blamed Avard for teaching many false and pernicious things of which he had been ignorant as well as innocent, which could be true. Then oddly, he chose to deny the ubiquitous rumor of polygamy though it had not been mentioned in the trial at all. So people aren't quite sure why he brought that up. One thing I don't think these Missourians saw coming was that when the account of Hans Mill got out to newspapers and people around the country, a lot of people were really angry. Even the people that didn't like Mormons could see how horrible it was and how unfair. And they realized that they were getting a whitewashed history of what had happened between the Missourians and the Mormons and that the burnings and pillagings that the Mormons had been doing were nothing compared to what the Missourians were doing to them and what happened at Hans Mill. And of course, it's not nothing. They shouldn't have done the things. They had every right to defend themselves. But going out and, and doing the things they did, they shouldn't have done. These people could see that in comparison, there was a huge difference of what the people were doing. And it became common knowledge that one member of the legislature had participated in the Hans Mill massacre. During this time, 
Far West needed a leader, and they had one in Brigham Young, who had managed to keep out of jail. He went to work with vigor that swept apathy and despair before it like a tidy broom, she writes. At his insistence, 200 of the best equipped families pulled all their food and equipment to be used for the common good. He dispatched emissaries ahead to make deposits of corn along the route and negotiate contracts for ferriage as they were leaving Missouri. In mid-February, he was forced to flee to Illinois to escape arrest, but his foresight was already bearing fruit. The saints endured much suffering in the exodus, but luckily the season was stormless and the frozen roads were relatively passable. Most of the Mormons stopped in Quincy, across the Mississippi River in Illinois, where the citizens there were ready to extend some sympathy and charity to them. They could see right away that there was no way they could help all of them. They didn't have the resources to help as many people as were showing up. All of a sudden there are these this huge group of Mormons that are coming to Illinois and she writes it this way. Real estate speculators in Illinois looked upon the Mormons as the fairest game that had ever come into the state. Long before all the fugitives across the river, proposals were pouring in. Isaac Galland offered a 20,000 acre tract lying between the Mississippi and Des Moines rivers in the Iowa territory at $2 an acre, the sum to be paid in 20 annual installments without interest. This was a part of the half-breed tract which had been set aside by the federal government for the offspring of the mixed marriages common in that area. The half-breed had sold and resold their claims for guns and horses, frequently selling the same claim to a half a dozen different bidders by using forged deeds. The worth of the Gallon's title to any part of the tract was extremely dubious. But the Mormons, they were as ignorant of this as they were of Gallon's bad reputation. His home county in Illinois, Hancock, knew him as a horse thief and a counterfeiter. But he posed now as a sympathizer and probable convert and wrote to the prophet in Liberty Jail. So Joseph was impressed by him and replied with enthusiasm to Gallon's commiseration and unctuous praise and expressed interest in this tract of land. Meanwhile, at the prison, they have decided to try to break out. The men planned one night to overpower the jailer when he brought their supper, but by a coincidence, six friends arrived for a visit that same evening and the jailer brought extra guards. Hiram rushed the jailer as he was admitting the visitors, but in the resulting confusion, the friends, who were ignorant of the plans, proved more hindrance than aid, and one guard escaped and slammed the heavy door shut. The visitors, who were promptly arrested, now looked hopeless, helplessly to Joseph for advice. After some weeks, the prisoners made a second attempt to win their freedom, this time by loosening the stones and timber in the prison wall. They used smuggled augers for tools, but the timber was tough and the auger handles gave away before the last stone was pried loose. When Rockwell tried to supply them with new tools, the guards became suspicious and discovered the hole. It was a fine breach, Joseph wrote afterward with satisfaction, and cost the county around some. It is told that all of the men that were imprisoned handled it really well, except for Sidney Rigdon. He complained, he whined a lot, and Joseph started to be disillusioned with him. He wrote that Rigdon said that the sufferings of Jesus Christ were a fool to his. I talked about how he and his family were living with Lucinda Morgan Harris, her husband, and she did tell a friend later that she had been his mistress during this time. And she went to visit him a few times, but she was turned away by the jailer. So he wrote her a cryptic and tender letter in which he hinted of a great plan that he would soon unfold to his most faithful followers. That is in the history of the church. A lot of people do think that maybe this is when he was starting to be start picking people to bring into his talks about polygamy. Finally, on April 6th, 1839, Joseph and his men were taken from Liberty Jail and carried off to Davies County which was the seat of their alleged crimes. They were deposited in the Gallatin schoolhouse. A man named Burnett reported that almost everyone at this trial was drunk, except for Joseph, who, though he passed around as much liquor as anyone, kept sober the whole time. The council again argued for a change of venue to another county. And the lawyers won their point, and with it, Joseph's freedom. Because on the way to Boone County, Hiram bought a jug of whiskey sweetened with honey. To this offering, Joseph added a bribe of $800. The sheriff obligingly sold them several of the horses, and about 25 miles from Adam on Diamond, obviously close to Far West, the guard got drunk and went conveniently to sleep. Joseph mounted a fine dark chestnut stallion and with the other prisoners close behind him pounded up the road and toward the old settlement where he joined the last remnant of the Mormons who were headed for the Mississippi. So now the Mormons are leaving Missouri to go to Illinois. I found those chapters really hard to read because it is so sad to see so much devastation and so much violence and so many innocent people hurt. No matter who Joseph Smith was, no matter what he did that was wrong, no matter what my opinion of him, the people that followed him many of them at this point were following him because they had faith in what he sold them. And it wasn't their fault that he did all those other things. So it is heartbreaking to see that kind of thing happen to innocent people, especially the children. If they had just been left alone, I don't know what would have happened. I'm not sure the church would have grown to what it is today if this persecution hadn't happened. It's an interesting thing to think about. So I'll see you next week with the next chapter on Nauvoo.